Very nice listener. This is part of us. This is our culture. Everything that I design revolves around my country. I'm very proud. Hello and welcome to Qatar 365 with me, Adil Halim. On this episode, we explore Qatar's burgeoning jewelry sector. Since ancient times, this sea has been a source of one of the country's most precious gems, natural pearls. So we sent Charlotte Dubinsky to find out why cut three natural pearls are still at the beating heart of the industry. You don't have to dive deep into Katas Pass to know that these waters have always been abundant with riches. Today it's oil and gas, but for centuries wealth came from oysters on the seabed. Mohammed is one of the few divers who's still seeking his fortune at the bottom of the ocean. It's before 2,000 years, people here in this land, whoever was in this land, They've been doing the pearl dive. They found a, a pearl before like uh, maybe four or six months. That pearl they found, it's uh, over 2,000 years. My grandfather actually, he was a pearl diver. When I asked my father, I want to go to the sea to catch some fish as a second job and to go to the fish market. He said, why you are a diver? Why you don't get some oyster to look for the pearl? Mohammed searches through his hoard. This time, no luck. Back deep below, he continues to search for oysters that may be hiding this precious commodity. So what signs is he looking out for? First of all, you should know that oyster, it's an old oyster, or it's a baby oyster. How can you know? the size plus the thickness of the oyster. And also there is another thing I'm looking on here, exactly. You see, there is a space from behind. More space you have here, more age you know about that uh, oyster. It mean it's older than the others. Though many pearl divers use tanks to stay underwater longer, Mohammed still practices the art of free diving. He's trained to be able to hold his breath for long periods while he combs the seabed, just like his forebearers. One of the oldest professions in the Gulf region, men also used to rely on tying stone weights to one leg and a nose clip as they descended deep to find oysters. Very nice lister. What kind of size is that? It's uh, maybe 3.2, uh, 3.5, maybe. The colour, it's, it's almost got like a bit of grey in it. Yeah, grey, and if you want to say it's a little bit green, you can say green. Yes. Yeah, I'm happy. That begins a streak of luck. And we have more here. You see the pair? This is An incredible haul for Mohammed because natural pearls are incredibly difficult to find. Those smaller beads are perhaps more common, but to find an oyster with a large natural pearl inside, it's more like one in every 10,000. That gives you a sense, an idea as to why they're so expensive and for many, so desirable. But for Mohammed, this isn't about making a wage. Natural pearl diving is a calling, a link to his past. And for him, this is about keeping old traditions alive. This is part of us. This is our culture. That's what our grandfather was doing for a living. And for now, we can make money also from it. So there is a lot of reasons pushing me to do that thing. And I love it. I'm a diver. So we know the pearl industry was Qatar's lifeline before the discovery of oil and gas here. But apart from being vital to the livelihood of the local community, pearls are embroidered in Qatari culture and heritage. To learn more about this, I met with Jasim Al-Khawari here 
at the National Museum of Qatar. Thanks for joining us, Jasim. Why have naturalized pearls from the Gulf always been such prized possessions? The first exports of pearls were coming out of the Gulf, actually. So people in the Gulf discovered the pearls first, they were exported them first. And even later on, when they discovered there were pearls in other locations and they were traded to, uh, the Gulf pearls, especially the Basra pearls, were considered the most uh, expensive type of pearls because they have a unique light uh, uh, fracturing uh, structure to them. And they have a unique, unique shapes, uh, which makes the rounded ones the most expensive one. And that was kept through over the years from 2,000 years ago to today. There was a huge demand for Qatari natural pearls in Europe, but where else did they end up? So the pearls uh, reached all over the world, uh, Western Europe, all the way to, to China and uh, East Asia. And one of the items that we have here in the gallery, especially in gallery number seven, which is at the center of the museum, is the Baruda carpet, which was made in India by the Indian Maharaja and Baruda. We think of pearls as being used to make jewelry, but what else were they used for? So pearls were used to decorate uh, many pieces uh, of uh, uh, furniture, uh, even the mother of pearl, that is the uh, lining or the pearlescence that's on the inside of the oyster were, were used in many uh, uh, cultures and uh, uh, all over the world. Well, the Baruda carpet was a gift from the Indian Maharaja uh, of Baruda uh, to the Muslims and to be a cover for the grave of the Prophet Muhammad So he made an entire piece, uh, an entire carpet uh, of uh, pearls and other precious gems. Now, you mentioned the collapse of the industry. How did that happen? Till 1930s, the main export of Qatar was the pearls. But during that period, especially a Japanese man called Mikimoto Kuchi, he developed the cultivated pearl industry. And with the cultivated pearl industry, uh, this collapsed the natural Gulf pearl industry here because uh, collecting 8,000 oysters from the waters you would only yield 5 to 15 pearls max. They wouldn't always look good. Some of them would vary in shape, size and color. Uh, but with the cultivated pearl industry, you can plant 8,000 oysters and collect uh, the shape, color and size that you want exactly, which drop the price of the natural Gulf pearl. Uh, and then after that, uh, the industry here on the Gulf slowly died over uh, 20s and 30s. So how does the National Museum highlight what the pearls mean to Qatari culture and heritage? We highlight the depth of the pearling industry, speaking about the pearl trader first, and then the reach of the pearls to all over the world from uh, Rome in 2000 years ago, all the way to North America in 1930s, speaking of the importance of the pearls uh, during that period and how they were the most expensive type of jewelry to be worn by celebrities or royalties around the world. As we've been exploring, Qatar has a long history with jewels. And for one designer here in Doha, it's the country itself which inspires her creations. Let's check it out. Despite their expense, natural pearls are still in demand. Award-winning designer Nada bin Hamis Al Soleti says for some clients, they're irreplaceable. That's me. I think I like this. I think we need more. So there is there is a market just for natural pearls. There are people who buy only natural pearls and they don't believe in cultured pearls. And we have a lot of clients in this region that they don't buy but natural pearls. Now, if we talk about that market, it's considered 5% of the market only. However, natural pearls are still in, will always be in, and will always be in style. Now for us, we use it primarily in, in high jewelry and bespoke pieces made to measure. The collections here at Hairat take inspiration from the length and breadth of Qatar. The brand is internationally recognized, but all designs are rooted deep in the country's natural beauty. Since I was young, I've been going with my parents around the country to see the, the desert, the, uh, the sea, the ruins, uh, old houses and whatnot. And I've always seen beauty. Ever since then, I've always wondered how can I um, use that in a creative way. And then I've noticed that my language is jewelry. And I found a medium to translate the beauty that I see in, in, around me in everything, in all the details we have here, into a wearable art 
and a daily um, uh, use pieces. And just to see it is a very fascinating site. It's protected by uh, the museum authority. It's a site that have rock carving um, in the ground on rock. One of the techniques that I like is the repetition because that continuity gives sous to the eye and the negative positive space. I'm wearing those rings. I have created those rings for me back in 2014, just for me before I, I launch it as a fine jewelry collection. The inspiration Cutter has provided is clear to see, but each of these pieces also tell a story. If you look closely at this ring, it looks like the shape of Cutter, with a chunk taken out of it. For Nada, it's important that she shares the inspiration she gleans from Qatar with the world. I'm very proud of my origin. I mean, I'm an international person. I've lived in Europe, I've lived around the Middle East, I've traveled um, all over the place, but I still be connected and rooted here. I like to learn from other cultures, but I want not to forget my origin, and I, I'm proud of it. So I think, yes, maybe subconsciously, it came out in the cutout. From the country's rich history with natural pearls to unique jewelry creations, we hope you picked up some gems on this episode. And that's all the time we have for now. For more, check out euronews.com. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time on Cutter 365.